Hi, welcome to Thank Good It's Friday, brought to you by Kono Wines. I'm Carolyn Enting, editor of Good Magazine, and today's topic is floristry and gardening. We have some wonderful guests on the show today. We've got um, the Green Sister, Judy Keats. Hi, Judy. Hi. Great to see you there. We also have Rosie Holt um, from Rose Tinted Flowers in Ponsonby Central. Hi, Rosie. And we have our um, commercial manager from Good Magazine, um, Justine Jamison, joining us as well. Hi. So today, um, well, the idea behind these Thank Good Fridays live streams um, is to support local businesses and also bring people together on a Friday afternoon over a, a drink. So today our drink of choice is a lovely um, Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc from Cono Wines. And... Um, it's really lovely. We've actually had this on the show before and I'm very happy it's back because I really enjoy it. It's got a lovely um, crispness, but also quite fruity. And what's also exciting today is that uh, Conno Wines, if you go to their website, um, connowines.co.nz and you use the code TOGETHER, uh, when you buy your wine, you can get a 5% discount and also Conno will donate 5% to restaurants and cafes that own, um, that, sorry, that sell their wine um, they're also giving away five vouchers fifty dollar vouchers to restaurants and cafes that um, sell their wine as well um, so if you go to their website and um, sorry to our website you can find out how to enter that um, and congratulations to the winners last week that won those kind will be sending those vouchers out we also are giving away four 100 dollar vouchers um, from King's Plant Barn today, which is very, very exciting. Um, so the link, if you want to enter any of these competitions, is to go to good.net.nz slash competitions. So it's great to have you guys here today to talk about gardening and flowers. I know a lot of us have been spending a lot of time in our gardens lately. And of course, flowers really lift the spirits. Um, and today I thought I'd fluff it a bit. I usually start off with the first question, but I thought I'd ask my colleague Justine to start off with the first question of today. Thanks, Carolyn. So, uh, yeah, I'm really excited about these topics. They're my favourite topics on earth. So um, I really wanted to start off with just talking to Judy about um, obviously community gardens can really shape a community and I know you're doing a lot of work in that sort of area um, and you're actually in one at the moment. <laughs> so I really wanted, my question was to you that I was watching this documentary a wee while ago that was talking about what had happened in Detroit with all these factories closing down and lots of people were like losing, had lost their jobs and there was a lot of unemployment and lots of poverty. And they created this garden um, that was feeding the homeless. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your opinion about what, um, what we could do as a nation to help with our Obviously, there's homeless happening at the moment. It's, a, it's really bad at the moment. So um, how, how we could help and what use of what your ideas are around uh, potentially what councils could do and things like that within their local gardens. Great. Thanks, Justine. So I'm here at Kelmana Gardens, which is in the central city. And this garden has been around since the 1980s. And it wasn't always a community garden, but the people that set it up did it on the right um, they set off on the right foot. They were all about sustainability. And this garden as it stands now is about inviting anybody in, no matter where they come from or what their condition is. So we have therapy gardeners that come in and, and spend time here. So we actually have a homeless group of people that come and support us um, maybe once a month. So they get a taste of what it's like to grow food or they may already have the skills to grow food, but not necessarily necessarily the location to continue that in their own backyards but at least we're giving them that opportunity to connect with us as community as part of our community and also you know they they carry that seed back into their own environments so yeah they're, they're, i wish there was more and this is a growing there is a growing momentum around community gardens and you know more and more we're becoming urban farms because we want to feed the local community whoever that be mm. but we should be supporting local because this is what we've recognized through COVID it's like you know let's support our community whoever's mm. whoever's part of our community yeah 
So who gets who gets to eat all the food in your garden, uh, growing in your garden? So how does that work with regards to to people that work on it get fed from the gardens, or how, how does that work? So if you come and volunteer with us, we feed you. So we have we're organically certified, so you get a really decent, nutritious lunch when you come and work with us. So that's twice a week, Tuesdays and Fridays. So yeah, I mean, again, you take away a full belly after working with us for a day or <laughs> half a day, really. Yeah. I suppose there are also a lot of fruit trees around um, in the neighbourhoods. You know, a lot of people have grapefruit trees, lemon trees, lime trees, mandarins. Um, Justine, you were mentioning the other day about some way you could register your tree on online yeah so i went to or a wee while ago i used to use this um where you would google is it um uh, fruit trees google fruit trees or something and it was coming up and it had a map where um you could travel around and pick fruit that wasn't um wasn't being used by people and obviously there's so much fruit there's persimmons like ridiculous everywhere at the moment isn't there? i'm oh, just seeing them dropping on the ground and yeah do you remember the name of that justine because i have heard of that as well Can yeah you... i did it i sorry this has just sprung on me so i'm not i i think it was just google fruit fruit trees and it's on google maps so yeah. if you're on google maps and you just say google fruit trees i think um i can update it in the link below or Hema will probably do that <laughs> i'm digital editor um but yeah it's it's a great opportunity for people. And I used to get all my fruit that way. So I would grow my own vegetables and then go to other people's gardens and collect the fruit. You feel like a bit of a creep doing it. <laughs> but it's a great, I think it's a great um, initiative for people to go and use that, yeah. Well, oh, that's great. Well, because like gardening also makes you really, for me anyway, I feel it really improves my mental well-being, And I also know that, receiving flowers or giving flowers has also been proven, I think, through, through research, um, Rosie, to um, improve your mental wellbeing. Um, could you chat to us a little bit about how flowers can help us with that and, and why they make us happy? I mean, flowers are one of those things where it's a traditional feel good. They have got that feel good factor, don't they? Whether you are gifting flowers or receiving them or just strolling along and just pick a few flowers, I feel like it just has that natural, just boost the endorphins. So. Um, and I think for me, being around flowers all day, I'd get that boost nine to five, Monday to Friday, and even longer. Um, so I just think um, for me, especially, and then I come in and talk to people about flowers or people come into our shop and ask about flowers and I will absolutely chew their ear off about how wonderful they are. And then there's sort of, I don't know, different fragrances and just all the different varieties. And I could, yeah, literally talk someone's ear off about how great flowers are 24 seven. And then people look at me weird and they think of another crazy flower lady. And I'm like, yeah, well, you're not wrong. So when, when I was younger, I had um, a depression when I was when I was like early, early 20s. And the way I got through it was actually just by looking at the beauty in the world. And I did it by going on walks and looking at looking out for flowers. Mm -hmm. And it was one way that I could start to search for the beauty in the world rather than you know, rather than actually looking for the negativity in the world. And that, yeah, yeah. it's just something that got me through it, yeah. It's a beautiful sharing, Justine, actually, because I remember, God, it was a, it was over 20 years ago now, and I my father was tragically killed in a car accident, and I went into a deep depression for probably a good year. And I remember going to a healer, and she and she just gave me this rose, and she just sort of said, um, and I just got to into this rose, and she said, it's, you know, you've, won't go too deeply, but I remember just seeing, it was just a pivotal turning point in my grief journey at that point where I had to make a decision to, you know, stop wallowing in my grief and now it was time to pick myself up and step out of it. And it was just this really symbolic thing. And it, yeah, it's, flowers are just so incredibly powerful. It's, mm -hmm. And um, Judy, you've got a whole bunch of flowers there as well. I have. I guess I um, have these right here now is because some of them, I want to show you what's, what's edible in the mix. So we have Dianthus. This is Dianthus, and we have um, another Dianthus, and we also have Calendula, which is a beautiful healer as well, a skin healer. So that's a really, that you can use that when you make your skin balms for healing your skin. And also I have Alyssum. So this smells actually like honey when you put your nose up to it. 
that this is, can also be planted under your brassicas this time of year because you get problems with the cabbage white butterflies coming in and this will actually kind of they, they see it as one of them it's like they, it's it, they're territorial so you know put that put that under as a companion plant under your brassicas what else have I got probably uh, another one here is Cleome which you don't really see so much this time of year it's, it's around in the summer and you'll see it with purple flowers and blue flowers and pink flowers it's um but it's another companion plant or a sacrificial plant. So you plant it so that your shield bugs will actually grab onto this over going for your beans or your tomatoes. So they, they climb up and, and munch away on this plant. So this is also known as spider plant, but its name is Cleome. Um, yeah, there's a few out of my mix. Thanks, Carolyn. Fantastic. Well, actually, Justin and I both wanted to chat to you about companion planting because I've tried that. I know it's good with, I've heard that, Basil and tomatoes are a great combination and that seemed to be work really well for me. And I also bought a whole bunch of marigolds um, to try and keep them away, the, the moths away or the butterflies yeah, away. And, and the, um, the white fly as well. So a lot of those insects don't like the colour yellow. So that's why yellow is really good to have in your garden. Okay, because for some reason, I don't know what it is, the snails or the slugs, they just love the marigolds and they just came right, up. Yeah. It was like a marigold massacre that just the heads were like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God. And then I'm thinking, it only lasted one day. I planted them yesterday and there's, you know. Yeah, five, when five. they're young, so it's a really good idea to protect your seedlings, whatever they are. So you can cut up your bottles, your milk bottles, and then you've got a little cloche to put over your seedlings. So when you find that that happens, you can totally be put off growing anything ever again but this is what works so so try giving them a bit of time under these cloches it's a, like a mini hothouse as well so you know you're protecting your plants and then the bottom you can use as for the slugs and snails you sink that into the soil and you pour in your beer and that's what they'll go for over going for your marigold so that's an option to try out <laughs> <laughs> I have tried the beer too. I tried kombucha too, but they didn't like the kombucha. They only liked the beer. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I did, I did a, um, a, quite a, a different thing for my, my garden. I was telling you, Judy, the other day, is I um, put the intention out with my garden that the snails could eat one plant, but they couldn't eat the rest of them. So I said, right, you've got this plant to eat and that's it, and the rest is my food, so stay away. And I, I put it with deep intention, <laughs> and then um, and they all went to my neighbour's plant, uh, um, vegetable garden that's right beside me, so I thought, oh, this is great, this is working magic. Like, I was surprised that this magic worked, but I don't know why I was surprised that magic worked, because it always does. <laughs> but they tried it. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, but then it wore off. The magic wore off after a while and they came back and they came back with vengeance and there, there was a massive like. <laughs> Did anything survive? Uh, yeah, they, they came back. It seems once they grow and they get a bit bigger, then they're just not, they're not as wanted. So is that right? Like once, it, once something gets a lot bigger, it doesn't seem as tasty to them. Well, it's more established. The, the plant's taken hold on its own, so it doesn't, yeah. It, it fends for itself, you know, it's right. got more power when it's, yeah. Yeah, it's putting out its own magic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I haven't tried the beer thing yet because I haven't got down to buy some beer. I don't normally buy beer, so. Yeah. also tried coffee grounds and, and uh, crushed um, eggshells. Eggshells, but... they're not so effective. So what I've also seen work quite well is actually the skins or the rinds of um, lemon or of your citrus after you've used the juice, use those rinds. So just hang them, place them on the soil in your garden. Um, another one is wood ash if you've got, got fires, you know, so you can use that because snails and slugs don't like going over anything sharp. So the eggshells, I don't know. I, don't, I haven't had that much success. I don't know if yeah, there's no, other people out there that say they have. You have? No. no. They just walk over the, over the eggshells. Yeah. Yep, they hard ones to get rid of. Yeah. Um, okay. I've just got one more question for you, Judy, and then I'll. Um, there's a question that's coming for Rosie from a sure. viewer. Um, but when you mentioned citrus, um, putting it on the ground, um, Judy, it made me think about compost and what you can 
and what you can't put in a compost. I've always been told you shouldn't put citrus in a compost because it will make it more acidic. It actually is fine in your compost. It's your worm farm you don't want to put your citrus because it, it actually burns the worms. But there's a whole lot of other sets of microorganisms in our compost systems that will actually deal to the citrus. It just they, they will all move away from it and then the worms will come and find it as it's decomposing. So don't be put off. Use it. Don't throw it in the main bin. Use it in your compost because just don't put it in your worm farm so much. Yeah. Are there any bad citrus in my worm farm compost bin i feel really bad now yeah i guess if it's working really well rosie it will actually be fine like you know if it's it's the population is substantial it'll actually it'll be fine it'll be able to cope with it okay yeah. good i felt bad i was like oh there's been a few half lemons gone in recently <laughs> it throws me off and i keep forgetting <laughs> what about other things that you can't put on like can you put meat and bones and if you're a meat eater or can you put bread in because I've heard that that can also attract rats I mean, it does attract rats so ideally what you would do with that, that material is you would bakashi first so bakashi is a fermentation process so I work for compost collective and and teach seminars on this a lot but you know those things you because you don't want to you don't want to be dealing with rats we minimize the amount of that material that goes into the compost so it's just a fermentation process just like making kombucha or sauerkraut um, and you get two fertilizers you'll get your liquid off your food material and then you have a solid which is mostly food material but it's been inoculated with bacteria so these this bacteria actually does more work in your compost and then into your garden so it actually balances out, you know, any imbalances. It helps to do that. But also it's like when your plants are planted into that, it's like you're, planting, uh, you're growing plants on steroids. They just, their health improves. You know, you get more production out of your plants. It's just beneficial in so many ways. So I highly recommend that. Right. And I know you can throw, obviously, flowers onto your compost too. And, yep. the best. and uh, Rose, I've got a question here from Andrea. And she mm -hmm. asks, what are the best flowers for drying and any tips for how to dry them and how to keep them looking good afterwards okay so there's so many flowers that you can dry and it's obviously so popular at the moment um really good flowers for drying is not actually a flower but eucalyptus the foliage is really nice because it retains that nice silvery color and it for a while maintains that really nice fragrance you know that eucalyptus oil fragrance and you don't really have to hang it to dry it i mean the stems will droop a little bit but you don't necessarily need to hang it to dry whereas with things like roses you do otherwise you know when you get a bouquet after a week the stems sort of wilt so you need to make sure you hang things like roses before you dry them um things like proteas are amazing so you know what a fresh protea looks like it's sort of that big like bulb shape or the king protea that looks a bit like a crown you don't need to hang them to dry because of their massive thick woody stems they look incredible when they dry they go prehistoric and again it's one of those flowers that someone will come in ask one question and i've chewed their ear off for 20 minutes about how amazing they are um so proteas are definitely one of my favorite flowers to dry and there's no real secret trick you just leave them out of water make sure you dry the stems if you've got say i don't know a few stems in a vase you want to make sure the stems really dry otherwise they'll start to go moldy and start to rot which isn't great the smell's not so good um but when you dry them you want to make sure they're out of direct sunlight um when flowers dry you'll notice the color fades just like anything like the color will go quite muted so keep them out of the direct sunlight and that'll prevent the color fading too much with things like um, some hydrangeas, they maintain that really deep bluey purple color quite often. Um, but for the most part, flowers do fade at least a little bit as they start to dry. Um, I mean, I recommend if you haven't dried flowers before, just try stuff, hang stuff, um, somewhere dry and cool, uh, sorry, dry and warm, like a hot water cupboard if you've got one, or even just somewhere with a bit of um, air flowing through. You wanna make sure there's a bit of air flow, otherwise they will turn moldy. Um, yeah, just try anything. Um, I've been drying some delphiniums, like like big long stemmed delphiniums. I didn't think they were dry and they look incredible. And they're just so paper thin, the flowers, once they dry and they just look insane. So just try it. Um, another side note to drying is pressing flowers. You can, um, you, you don't need an actual flower press, just take off the pretty heads, flatten them, put them on a paper towel, put a paper towel on top and in a heavy book. 
and that's a really good way of pressing flowers and you can I don't know when I was little with my grandma I used to press them and um, put them on cards and make birthday cards for mum and dad and stuff so pressing flowers is my new favorite thing yeah hot tip it's very on trend at the moment isn't it I'm seeing uh, my friend just bought a beautiful um a, like glass round bit of glass and it had flowers in it just to hang in the sun it's really oh, yeah. beautiful yeah 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 I so love it. And they yeah, sort of like reflect light and stuff. It's just a really beautiful, again, so like a mood elevator as well. It's sort of just this little thing and just like reflecting the light. And you sort of see, I don't know, the light come through the dried flowers and you feel the veins in them. And it just gives you a whole other appreciation for flowers and plants, I think. Because like Mother Nature, she's crazy clever and she's created all these incredible things. And I don't know, you look at a flower and you kind of take in its beauty and like how incredible it is. And you're just like, oh, Mother Nature, you're the bomb. <laughs> yeah I think I think with, it must be so rewarding being a florist I mean I I, I worked in a, a florist for a, a few weeks and just the feeling that, of just creating and and stuff it must be a beautiful job to to know that everything that you're creating is is you know it must be quite an intuitive job as well right to to feel what the person that the and receiving these flowers and do, do you find that do you find it's quite an intuitive job yeah definitely especially if like we do a lot of online but in store you've just got to be really authentic because like we gen we genuinely love flowers and want people to love them as much as we do um and yeah when someone comes in and they sort of say oh i'm looking for a bouquet you sort of want to find out what the occasion is or who they're for and then you kind of just open a dialogue and I don't know, some people I'll end up chatting to for 20 minutes, half an hour, just because we just love chatting about flowers and then like, oh, shit, I've got to go. But it's just, yeah, it's a really nice thing. And often it's quite a personable thing, um, um, whether it's like a celebration or a commiseration. There's always a story behind it. And yeah, one, lady, oh, one of my favorite stories is one lady came in and she was obviously really upset and she was purchasing flowers for a friend's mother's funeral. And then she was just like on the verge of tears and she burst out crying. I was like, come sit down, like have a cup of tea. It's fine. And like sat her down. And then the next time she came in, I was really sad because my dog had just died. And she was like, well, you made me feel good. Now I'm going to make you feel good. And it was just, and she now was one of our regulars and comes in every other day and buys flowers. And it's just those lovely special moments. And yeah, it's just very special. So, so That's nice. So speaking of um, ceremonies and things like that, obviously with the government, with all the lockdowns of um, weddings and um, funerals, how's that affecting your business? Oh, it, it was a whirlwind of emotion a month ago. We've sort of, I don't know, leveled out a bit now, but it was just crazy sort of when it all, when COVID first sort of hit and when it felt like it was really going to affect us down here in New Zealand, um, it was really bizarre. I was sort of calling our brides and just finding out what they were thinking of doing and some were like no no we're gonna go ahead there's like a handful of people from overseas that can't come to the wedding doesn't matter it's about us it's our day but then yeah it really that's when everything sort of started to happen here and lockdown was being talked about it was really scary and um yeah i sort of got in touch with the majority of our couples and just to find out what they were thinking were they wanting to postpone or cancel and they were just like they just said how nice it was to have a florist that cared and just yeah wanted to help them replan for later on down the line or a couple sort of brought their wedding forward they said look they want to get married and they're going to do it and just just like anything like this weird situation that we're in um just having to be flexible and compassionate and just understanding mm -hmm. that it's not always going to work with everyone and you just need to be as flexible as you can be but like all of our sort of april may even some brides from later on in the year they postponed till 2021 um because, yeah, you just, we just don't know what's going to happen. And some people had lots of friends and family coming from overseas. But for the most part, they've all kind of settled on a new date for next year. But, yeah, really scary and unsettling for couples who just didn't know if they could get married and when they were going to get married. So, yeah. No. So it's feeling like there's a light at the end of the tunnel now, which is quite nice. Do you actually um, wouldn't have been able to obviously send flowers out during level four? And I saw that a lot of growers were having to unfortunately dumped their flowers which was just so yeah. awful, awful to see and like, there was a lovely story about um one girl being able to sit, make a whole bunch of bouquets and take them to um a hospital and let all the nurses take bouquets home which was, it was really so lovely. 
Yeah, yeah, it was heartbreaking. And we've got lots, we work really closely with some growers and especially sort of, I mean, whether you're a big grower like on a big commercial scale or just a small backyard grower, you put so much love into growing those flowers and it's, I can't imagine what it'd be like. It's it's hard enough when we buy stuff from the flower market and I don't know a stem snaps and you have to put it in the compost, but to grow something from a seedling up to a fully formed flower and just have fields of it destroyed, it's, yeah, it's so sad. No, it was so, sad. I've just got a question come through for Judy um, from Craig. <laughs> <laughs> um, Craig asks, what is the process of setting up an organic veggie patch from scratch in the backyard? Quite is a big... it a process? Sorry, I missed the beginning of it. Uh, yeah, what is the process for setting up an organic veggie patch from scratch in the backyard? Good question, Craig. So I guess um, if you're starting with a backyard that's lawn, so I think it's a really good idea to get a whole lot of cardboard and you're going to use that as the base of your veggie box. So I'm thinking out loud here, thinking it would be a raised box that you would put on the, on your lawn. So you layer your cardboard because you want to suppress the grass. And then you're going to start building soil. So you can actually just layer materials just like you would in your compost bin. So green and brown, green and brown materials. So green, I'm talking nitrogen rich. So that would be all your grass clippings. And then you would top that with some hay or straw. And then you would add your food scraps. And then you would add your dry leaves. So you're collecting your dry leaves right now in autumn. So you're layering. All that material is going to decompose and turn into soil. So then you've got a product then right there for free in your back, in your in your garden box and you can start planting now that process would probably take about three months for the material for the materials to decompose so that's how i would go about it the boxing you can get kit sets from cypress sawmills or from mac direct so they do macrocarpa boxes so you want untreated wood you can also look at pallets pallets are free a free resource so you can pull those apart and make your own structures yeah over to you what you use as eating yeah like that, huh? Just like that. God, I need to go get myself a big bag and start filling it with some leaves now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, oh, sorry. No, you go first, Rosie. <laughs> I know ash is good for citrus trees. Is it good sort of to use on veggies and other things that you've got in the garden growing already, or is it not so much? Is it more? So make sure your ash is from untreated wood. So it's 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 high in potassium. So you can use it around your fruit trees, yes, and you can use it in your compost, both. Oh, okay, top tip. Excellent. Just make sure it's all like completely gone cold before you put it. Yeah. Oh, okay, excellent. Yeah, we've just started lighting our fire at home and it's so good. But yeah, we had so much ash around our lemon and our lime tree last year. So, so, so that's really good. They need that. They need potassium. All trees need a balance of minerals and they come from different ingredients. So, you know, if you can go and get seaweed from the beach, that's a really great source of trace minerals. If you go and get, um, you can use, uh, I dry out some invasive weeds. So things like kaikuyu grass, I actually make mulch out of kaikuyu grass, dry it out. And then I pack that around my fruit trees. So all fruit trees need food. So we forget to feed them. So these materials are available as free resources. So once you start packing, you know, you make your um, mulch around your trees. You know, you can do the same thing with your fruit trees. You can layer your cardboard and then start layering those materials on top of the cardboard and that's decomposing into compost. But it's all food for the trees. Yep. That's brilliant. And then, you, then you start planting, you start planting your flowers underneath your tree. So you have your beneficial plants that attract all the pollinators, right? So the pollinators and the predatory wasps are coming in. So that that controls and also brings balance to the pests or diseases that may be occurring in your fruit trees, right? So you do need this. Oh, I've got I've got an apple tree. That's um, sorry, Carolyn. I've got an apple tree that's uh, it's got the holes and stuff. It's like getting it's got a moss or something that's going and eating it all. Guava <laughs> moss. Guava moss. Is there have you got anything um, that we should be using for that? 
Yes, so this is becoming a huge problem in Auckland and Northland because they it likes the warmer weather. But this guava moth is detrimental to lots of our fruit trees. You'll find it started probably in your feijoas and now you're finding it in your apples and you're seeing it in your citrus. So it's actually, it has a short life cycle. So make sure if your trees have got it, that you're collecting all the fruit from the ground. And I suggest freezing it before you compost it so that you kill all the pupae, all the larvae inside the fruit before you compost it so it's all about hygiene i know we don't we're time poor and we can only do so much but if you want your fruit from your trees and you want to eradicate the guava moth that is one thing justine it's not the only thing There's, it's a multi-pronged approach you kind of need to make traps that you hang in your trees but it's a really basic um, recipe i don't have it on me but i'm happy to provide it to you but again it's not maybe the only thing we can be doing it's it's a real it's a huge pest and it's becoming worse. So until it really hits our Fijoa industry, we're not going to have support from the government to get rid of it. But I think a lot of home growers are really struggling with guava moth now. I know they are. And I've heard neem oil, is that? Yep. So neem is actually, it has it's detrimental to other soil life. So what you use, how much neem oil you use is kind of important, but you can get neem granules. So it's a time of year that you put them around your fruit trees as well. So springtime is a good time to do that when the larvae are moving. So nice. they're moving up into the tree from maybe the ground where they're pupated. So, yeah. yeah my um, my um, tree trees got decimated the last two years, from a moth. And so this year I was like, right, I'm going to nip this in the bud, so to speak. And I, and I went to King's Plant Barn, actually, and they gave me some fantastic advice. And, and yeah. I said, oh, look, I've... And I started too late. Like he said, you should hang neem. He said one way, great way of doing it because a lot of those pheromone traps you buy are really expensive. And and he said, and he said, what you do is you hang neem um, granules and and like an old sock. Although I found pantyhose better because a sock isn't very long to tie around a tree. And I was I was trying to tie the sock around and it wasn't going. Um, but it's quite good. It did have some success. So I have managed to save some fruit. Um, although I started too late. He said when it's you know, just before I even start flowering or budding, you should basically hand protect that, put that protective stuff up. Yeah. Um, and also fruit trees. I managed to kill three citrus trees oh, that I planted. I, I don't know, but I put them in clay and I put them in a dry spot because they said that they don't like wet roots, but then I've got this clay. That's right, Carolyn. Most of us have got clay. <laughs> so clay is what we're starting with as our base soil, right? So really important when you're planting a tree or when you're planting a garden that the right nutrients can be accessed or the nutrients can actually be accessed by the plants that you're growing. So good idea to get composting before you do any planting so that you've made a medium in which to grow in. So you've layered that on top of your clay soil or when you're digging a hole, you you put a, my mix when I when I plant a tree will be um, 30, well, um, half a bucket of compost, half a bucket of, of uh, actually scoria. Do you know what I mean? Scoria, like small rocks or pumice. So it's got good drainage, but then I will also inoculate the roots with mycorrhizae fungi. So all these things work to give the tree the best start in life and also support it through life when we think about mycorrhizae fungi they're doing work in the soil they work with the tree roots to provide food to the trees so that would help them in any soil so but definitely the compost and the scoria help for those other two reasons i mentioned but um what did you do carolyn did you um <laughs> i just dug holes and stuck the trees into the clay yeah. <laughs> probably why they die um <laughs> and water water is essential like you know we're in a drought right now so you know if i'd planted a tree i'd choose winter uh winter or winter or spring to be planting so we're in a rainy season so but also for for that year for that first year of the tree's life it actually needs moisture at its roots so you should be watering it quite regularly to give it a good start yeah in life That's you need to nurture yeah <laughs> well, i've got a question from katrina um she's asking judy um have you noticed an uptake in composting since lockdown um so it's one question and i want to add to that about um 
safety around compost. I mean, we're in COVID now where a lot of us are wearing masks, but I understand that it's also important to wear masks when you are handling compost, especially compost that you maybe, I don't know, is it home compost dangerous? Or I know some people, you know, that have died from inhaling compost. So Legionnaire's disease, yes. So uh, there, there's a reason there's the warnings on the bags of compost when you that you buy, um, you know, because we can contract it, but it's nothing to be hugely afraid of, but just don't breathe in when you open a bag of compost. And when you're turning your compost and you see lots of steam coming off it, stand back, because that's where it will be air bound, the, um, the, the, the bacteria. So just be careful. I haven't got to the point of wearing a mask, but it's not about me only. It's about you, you, you and your hygiene with your compost. So be aware that you have to be careful. Take care. Um, yeah. So what else about that? Uh, um, Katrina's um, question was that, has there been an uptake of compost interest? Yes, most definitely, Katrina. Um, you know, like this is the time people have been confronted with their food waste or their, they've been confronted with their wasteful stock, you know, like how much am I generating in my household and what, how can I deal with this better? So I think people are waking up to, yeah, keeping food waste out of landfill and actually taking those steps um, to start up systems at home. Yeah, I think it's been great for that. Yeah. Right. And that brings us to, um, I guess, question for you, Rosie, around um, forestry and sustainability, because it can be quite a wasteful industry with a lot of, you know, wrap and ribbons. How, how do you deal with things that um, rose tinted flowers? Um, we've well, we've completely stopped using plastic bags and cellophane and all those horrid lurexy shiny pearlescent papers because they're not recyclable. Anything that's sort of metallic or those pearlescent papers, they're not recyclable. Um, so, yeah, we about a year and a half ago made a switch to using biodegradable bags for when we wrap up bouquets and doing all of our wet wraps. I mean, it's still a plastic per se, but it's it's a better plastic and we try and whenever they'll come in they say oh yeah no I'm just going home we're like okay we're not going to give you a bag they're like I want one I'm like here's all the reasons why I'm not giving you one and some people get a bit uppity but I'm like okay well I'm not giving you one anyway um <laughs> so just being a little bit pushy with them but most people just don't realize it's a force of habit thing with people they just want the plastic around the ends and they don't realize it's not necessary so yeah just trying to educate people around having less plastic and things like that um, how, and then how about from the markets though because obviously the markets um are full of plastic and they have to you have to receive flowers and plastic what what do you do with that like how do you change that in the industry um so me and a couple of other florists we're again really pushy and really vocal towards the, um the flower markets and they're very sick of hearing us hearing of from us complain about it there have been a couple of growers who are so big commercial growers who now use paper sleeves around their flowers at the flower markets um so van leers is one and blooming hill is another so they yay for them <laughs> yeah. yay game changes <laughs> come on guys let's look. everyone pick up the pace but yeah there's um it's more small growers who are really good at not using plastic and i think it's just a mindset and I find it sort of the younger growers are probably more in tune or more um, aware of it than maybe the older growers. It might be a generational thing or just something that's in, in your psyche a bit more. Um, but there's a really wonderful collective called the Floral Collective and they in summer will meet up and all florists can go and purchase flowers from them. And all of their flowers are grown, I don't know, like in Helensville or um, Latakana, like really, really close by. So there's like a really low carbon footprint on the flowers and nothing is wrapped in plastic. It's all wrapped in twine or flax, which is amazing. It's like no rubber bands and it's just so wonderful to see. And it's just so much nicer getting a big bundle of flowers from a grower that's not wrapped in plastic. Mm -hmm. And because, yeah, there's, I, I tried calculating how many plastic sleeves go through the flower market every auction. And I, my brain stopped. It was just like, unfathomable. But yeah, we, we try to press upon like United Flower Growers how important it is to stop using plastic sleeves because they're just not essential. They're not, not, not necessary. So how can we support you as um, a community? Obviously, when I, when I was working in the floristry, my friend would just steal flowers all the time from everyone's gardens. 
<laughs> and so is there any way that us as like a community could could contact and say, hey, come and raid my garden and raid it, you know, which is not plastic full, it's free for you and it's it just is there what do you think about that? Do you anyone that's got flowers or even big beautiful flowering trees like one of my neighbors in my neighborhood has a beautiful pink revillia tree and I love it and like if I see if I'm driving around or walking the dog and I see a big tree or some flowers I really like I'll leave my card in someone's letterbox and just like <laughs> let me know if you need this trimmed and some people are just like yeah sure some people think you're crazy which is fair enough but yeah and then some people you just knock on the door and you just go hi I've got my snips do you mind if I just yeah give that magnolia a trim and most people just go, yeah, sure, it saves me doing it. And sometimes if it's a nice flower or something, I'll often pay them a bit of money. But most people are just stoked to have their shrubs trimmed because it's, yeah, one less thing for them to do. Yeah, and obviously, like, as a florist as well, there's not a huge markup in everything that you do. So it's really nice to be able to support the, your craft. And Thanks. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think if you floristry to become a millionaire, you do it because you love it. <laughs> Uh, just speaking of um, flowers and like in terms of tips, like have you got any tips, Rosie, on how to make your flowers last for a long time in your vase when you get it home? Um, so definitely when you get flowers, when you get a bouquet home, trim the ends again before you put them in water. Like it seems really second nature, but do, trust me, make, make sure you trim the ends on a 45 degree angle and put them in fresh water. Don't put them in I don't know, an old vase that's been sitting around since your last bouquet. Clean your vase each time, please, and put fresh water in it. And then you want as fewer leaves and things below the water line as possible. That's key because the more greenery is in the water, the faster the bacteria will grow, make your water go rancid, and then it'll just make your flower stems rot. And that's when you get that really rank flower smell, you know, that old flower water. It's just yuck. So, yeah, let um, trim your stems. Um, and make sure there's not much greenery underwater. And then just really sensible things, like don't put them in direct sunlight, they'll wilt. Don't put them under the heat pump, because they wilt. Don't put them like in front of the air conditioning, because they wilt. Like it seems sensible, but you'd be surprised how many people are like, oh, my flowers died in a day. I'm like, oh yeah, it was on top of the fireplace, no wonder. <laughs> and don't make your plants bleach. <laughs> yeah. Just don't. Oh, so they don't like bleach. They don't like it. Um, I mean, some someone told me you can put a dash of vodka in the water. It acts oh, yeah. as material. But I mean, I'm not going to waste my vodka on my flowers. Sorry, flowers. <laughs> and then aspirin works as well. It helps. Um, as it, it acts as a plant food, a flower food, apparently, in the water. Oh. Helps them last a bit longer. So aspirin, not Panadol, aspirin. Fantastic. I've just got another another question come through um, from Katrina. She's saying that she's learned in biodynamic agriculture that chamomile tea can help flowers last longer. Is that commonly known? No, there's a hot tip from Katrina. I might have to give it a try. So just adding hot chamomile tea to water. Yeah, chamomile tea can help flowers last longer. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm going to have to give it a whirl. Yeah, I, I love chamomile tea. I usually um, don't have any left after I've had a, have a cup, but I should try yeah. For me, cup for flowers. Yeah. <laughs> flowers for flowers. Yeah, there you go. Circle of life, etc. <laughs> and and Judy, um, I've been, you know, I, I sound weird a lot, so I don't mind saying this. <laughs> yes. Um, I talk to plants, and I when I water them, I talk to them, and I say, please stay alive. <laughs> What, what's your thoughts around of communicating with um, plants? And I do it all the time. I don't think you should be worried about it. It's yeah. like, you know, like you treat, well, I treat plants like children, you know, like you encourage them, you you say hi to them, you don't want to neglect them because you notice if you do neglect them, they don't perform. So we're, we're loving them. So they do respond to that. I mean, there's been plenty of studies done that there's, you know, I don't, I don't need to repeat them here, but I'm sure everyone out there has heard the different, um, you know, methodologies of of testing it out. But I think, yeah, you try it, try it, and see what happens. But I've what do you say, Justine? In your your what's what, that? Your, what's your outcome been talking to your plants? Have well, you I've never really been so great at indoor plants and at keeping them alive, and I've actually been quite neglectful at times. Um, and 
since lockdown, I, I went and brought, uh, I, I moved home and I decided I just wanted to fill the whole place with indoor plants. So I bought all these plants and um, I really put an intention out to really take care of them now. It's been like something like uh, just a, a thing within myself. I was like, these are your children. <laughs> Don't have children. These are your children. Take care of them. And I don't know if it's it's me taking care of them or my flatmate comes in and just waters them. <laughs> I'm not sure. But um, but that's that's. It was interesting during lockdown, watching your plants grow, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and how like we had that time to really just calm down and watch our plants grow. And my my friend came round. I probably shouldn't say that, but my friend came round and and said, "Did you know that that plant has got a, you know, looks like a little snake's tongue?" And I said, "Don't try and tell me what's going on with my plants. I know every single thing about my plants at the moment. It's my life." So, Rosie, I suppose you might be. I mean, you have, do you have? Um, I know lots of Florence uh, florists are selling. Um, indoor plants now are you doing anything like that or do you have lots of indoor plants we've just we tried selling plants a while ago and it didn't really take off and we've just started doing it again like after reassessing our business plan and pivoting not pausing etc um something we identified was that people are just loving plants for home office and stuff and i've now in the last week become a bona fide plant expert kind of (laughs) um no we've just started selling them and even in the last Two days since having them in store, people are going bananas for them. People are loving them. Um, we've got plants at home, and I call my boyfriend Sam our plant dad because he's the one that's always looking after them and talking to them and pointing out like a new sprout or a new shoot that's coming up. And he's like, Oh my God, have you seen them on stair? It's got a new leaf. And I'm like, I know, you've told me twice today. Um, yeah, seriously, he's the plant dad. But it's so nice. Like, we've got this big Strelitzia plant, and it's got a new shoot coming up, and the leaves on it are so big and I can't wait to see because it's growing up out of the middle so I think it's going to be the new tallest leaf I can't wait to see how big it's going to be they're like massive sales mm-hmm. they're insane yeah. and you must be seeing a growing trend um towards a lot more leafage with your bouquets and things is is that what yeah. have you got a flavor because every florist has some sort of like you know their own their own look don't they I mean, our stuff is definitely wild and deconstructed. It's not your bouquet of roses, lilies, and gerberas, um, because that's, it's not boring. There's a taste for everything, but it's just not my personal taste. So, I mean, even today I was chatting to a girl and she bought um, a bouquet. She wanted a bouquet for a friend. It was a thank you. And I found out that she likes drying flowers. So I was like, let's use this, this, and this. And so I used Erica, which is a type of heather, dries really nicely in eucalyptus. And it's like a really nice, big, long, wispy strands of eucalyptus I was like that will dry it'll last the eucalyptus will retain its fragrance and yeah just looks like a whole lot of stuff plucked from a little meadow so and she was chuffed so well, it sounds absolutely beautiful and do you have any tips with all these plants that you're selling I mean house plants especially I do have a special talent for killing them um <laughs> I either overwater them or underwater them I don't know I'm trying really hard I mean and every sort of plant's different. I mean, for example, orchids, um, they're, a one, they're a very popular plant to buy for people in, in, in lieu of a, a bouquet because they can last. And are there any sort of tips on how to look after those? I mean, it just uh, orchids can be really fickle. I've never successfully kept an orchid alive. <laughs> I might not be the best person to ask. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not alone. Um, so a tip I got from a friend who's also a florist for watering orchids, um, but the Phalaenopsis orchids, the moth orchids put an ice cube on once a day or once a week oh god I can't remember my tip now <laughs> we should do <Google> it. <laughs> Look it up. I'm pretty sure it's once a day just an ice cube it's all the water it needs once every day I might fact um, but yeah because I was like do you overwater it underwater and she said no, no one ice cube nice I've heard something about soaking them as well I think we probably need to google that question unless you know that one Judy I don't I'm not an expert on indoor plants. <laughs> the only orchid I have are outdoors. So, yeah, and that they, they seem quite happy. Yeah, what well, you know is working, talking yeah. to them. I just suppose if you to go away on a trip or anything, my aunt always said, she always says the best thing to do with your house plants is just put them outside on the deck because at least they're going to get some rain while you're away if you've got no one to water your plants. So that's one yeah. thing. 
some sun. I think I got told once to um, to ask the plant if they wanted water. So do you want water plant? Like thirsty. <laughs> And then just sit back and just feel it in your body whether or not it's like a yes or a no. Mm -hmm. And they tell you, they're like, no, get out of here. I don't want water. I've just been watered by your flatmate. Um, the thing is, with plants is I know if you do overwater some plants, their leaves go crispy and people often mistake that for thinking it's underwatered and drying out. So people pour more water on yeah. and actually they're killing it slowly. But I know lots of plants, they do need to just, like absorb the water you pour on, dry out, and then water again, rather than um, drowning them and them getting wet feet inside the pot. So, right. I've got a question from Kat. Um, this one I think is for you, uh, Judy. It's when replanting cuttings, how are they best handled and planted to ensure successful growth? Okay, so cuttings and it's timing really, cat for cutting, so at the time of year that you take your cutting. So now going into winter is probably not the best time but it depends if the, the plant actually grows through winter. So look at plant growth. So springtime is the best time for, for most things. Um, and yes, when you take your cuttings, there's different types of cuttings you can take. So you can take softwood cuttings, you can take mid hardwood cuttings and then hardwood cuttings, but you can try all three if you're not sure what's going to work. But once you have your cutting, you can dip that into some hormone. I dip it into a bit of honey first. So I put a bit of honey with some hot water because it's antibacterial. So your honey dip and then dip it into some hormone rooting powder and then into either a mix of sand and compost or straight sand. So you can buy a product called Cutting Mix from Bunnings. It's um, put out by Dalton's and it's actually a really nice um, mix of sand and pumice. So that's a really good way to start your cuttings in there. And it will depend on what the cutting is for how long it sits in that mix for before you transplant it into soil. So some things you can do straight into soil, they're quite hardy. Other things, you know, you're better off starting them off in the sand. Yeah, I'm sure you can find that at King's Plant Bun as well. <laughs> King's Plant Bun will have that. Don't forget, we've got four King's Plant Bun vouchers to give away today. $100 vouchers, which are great. So, yeah, go online to good.net.nz um, competitions. And we've also got um, I restaurant vouchers from Connor Wines. Plus, if you go to connorwines.co.nz and um, buy some wines and use the code together, you can get a 5% discount and also they'll donate 5% to the um, restaurants as well. So how is everyone enjoying their wine? Love Finished. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> need, a, need a topper. Yeah, I don't have a waiter here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, that's great. I'm, I'm definitely enjoying this one. It's really lovely. Well, I'm loving all these tips. Um, Rosie, you mentioned before about not doing your, you know, standard roses and gerberas and things like that. I mean, I remember my grandmother used to do a lot of flower arranging when I was really little. And um, she had these sort of, there were apparently rules around proportions of, you know, heights and things like that. I mean, are there still those sort of rules or does anything go now? I mean, are there some guidelines? I think there are definitely, I mean, there are rules per se, but I don't think it's necessarily the old rules of threes and fives and odd numbers anymore. I think um, there's not such, uh, it's not so regimented flower arranging. Like when you think of, I don't know, say from the 50s, 60s, 70s, even like the 80s, like there's, I don't know, there's big structured like floral art kind of arrangements and you kind of know it's very of a time and they very much had the rules around the proportions and things and it was I mean it's not bad it's just not my taste maybe um so now everything we do is very instinctual um it's just if I'm making it and I like it and I always joke that the flowers talk to me and tell me what they want to do and I don't force them to go into a bouquet where they don't want to go and um yeah there are definitely it's just very instinctive kind of like any sort of creative feel, whether it's, I don't know, painting or art or what have you. It's just like, it's very subjective as well. Like, you know what you like and you know what you don't like. And I think flower arranging is no different. Like one person's like golden grade of flower arranging will not be my taste and vice versa. What I do might not be someone else's taste completely. So just using your instincts. So if anyone at home wants to try flower arranging, 
um, or making a bouquet, just, yeah, just go for it. Just like get stuck in, have a go, whether you've just, I don't know, bought some flowers from the supermarket and want to have a go at it, just try it out and you'll get an idea of what colors really speak to you and what comes quite naturally versus what doesn't. I mean, there are certain colors that I really struggle to use. I struggle working with purple. I don't know what it is, but as soon as I get a purple flower in my hand, I have a little meltdown and I just can't do it. They say like color therapy and that is quite a big deal. Like when you look at um, different chakras and, and working with different chakras and how colors affect those and lots of people believe that they affect different chakras. And if you were to look at purple, for instance, would be your crown chakra. Probably, and it just makes... Sorry, your, your third eye chakra, sorry, your third eye chakra. Right, okay. <laughs> sorry, that's just some weird weird tips there. Oh, that the tips. <laughs> that reminded me of when I did, um, funny enough, when I was much younger, I fancied looking at floristry as a possible career option as a young teen. I think, you know, everybody, every girl loves flowers. Mm. And I remember doing this... Um, uh, work experience for a few weeks in this florist shop and been quite horrified because now this is back in the 80s and um, this florist was spray painting the carnations different colours to <laughs> make the bouquets and it was just kind of yeah at the time put me off the industry of it. Well spray painting is very much a thing now like if you yeah. see yeah, yeah. it definitely come around I mean we're not spray painting carnations but it's yeah it used so much at the moment it's very much the thing and it sort of came in just after dried flowers as kind of the novelty thing of flowers um there's lots of um florists overseas doing it quite a bit and a few florists over here as well and it's not my favorite thing again needing a mask because of all those fumes but um it's quite a buzz out when you're sort of working with a flower and then you spray paint it and it just ends up a completely different color to what you're instinctively used to in a flower um yeah, some of it looks quite cool, some of it not so much. Are you doing it, Rosie? We've done some of it, more for big events and things, just for impact. And um, we did a big dried installation and we used a lot of spray paint on it just to get that colour pop. So that really worked. Um, but every day in the shop, no. Nah. Well, I'm, I'm seeing some of these really um, out of it looking rainbow flowers now in some tacky, tacky places. <laughs> What, um, how are they making them? Is that all sort of genetically engineered or what, like what's going on? I'm not 100% sure how they do it. All I know is I don't like it and I'm not into it. <laughs> God, it sounds really judgmental. No, um, it's, yeah, it's not my thing. Um, I'm not sure how they do it. I don't know if it's a certain way they've breed, bred the flowers, whether it's a kind of hybrid or if it's a dye used to like soak up the stems to create that rainbow. But yeah, it's a type of chrysanthemum if it's the one I'm thinking, if you're, that you're mm. thinking about. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and no, that's it's not for me. <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't feel natural. It just feels like, I don't know, just, I mean, I know that there are different plants that you develop over time and there's different colours that you can create, but to do rainbow, how a... yeah. But I'm all for, like, a hybrid flower and, I don't know, someone will create a hybrid rose and it's just the most beautiful thing and the fragrance is outrageous. But, um, yeah, no, not so much with the, the rainbow for scents. I don't know who invented it or what they were thinking. I don't know, but they're, they're absolutely rich and because um, every dairy's got one. Yeah, this is true. Maybe you can become a millionaire in flowers after all. <laughs> Just sort of sell your soul. I need to go and check these out. I don't think I've seen them yet, but um, yeah. You'll see them enough, I'm sure. And then you'll be like, oh, my God, that's what they're talking about. Yeah. yeah everyone true. loves a rainbow, don't they? <laughs> it's true. Except a ra rainbow chrysanthemum. <laughs> Everything but them. Yeah, yeah, they're like off the list. Yeah. Well, it's been absolutely wonderful chatting to you ladies today about floristry and gardening. I've learned so much and um, things I'm going to apply in the future and um, I have to write some of these notes down as well. So, and so thanks for joining us for a lovely glass of Kono wine. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thanks, Kono for the lovely wine and uh yeah just a reminder to everybody if you would like to enter um competitions to win a king's plant barn voucher of a hundred dollars or to a restaurant voucher um or get a discount on your wine um go to good good magazine um sorry good.net.nz slash competitions and uh you'll be able to enter there so it's been so great having you guys here and cheers
Cheers. Thank good it's Friday. Yay!